So we're here at this event, all of us gathered together with this sort of common desired goal around how can we make the work experience more human, more engaging, more tolerable, whatever the word is, whatever your bar is. Sure. Um, in your in your work right now, what what are you seeing as kind of right in this moment in time, the biggest constraints or the biggest issues that your clients are facing around creating a more engaging human work experience? Uh, typically it's growth, right? So I live in the Bay Area where it's like the go big or go home. Sure. And um, it's my least favorite phrase actually. Um, well, I have a lot of. Least favorite. Yeah, I, so <laughs> there, there, a lot of things tie. Fair. Um, and typically the excuse is, you know, we would love to do that human thing. We just, we can't. Right. And the can't is money. The can't is time. Um, the can't is the leader believes in it, but the board doesn't, or the VCs don't. But there's some, something that's other oriented. It's not me. Typically, the people I talk to are like, oh, I would love to do that. It's just, right? And so what I try to get to is how do people uh, feel like they have a voice? And instead of feeling like it's other oriented, like it's the CEO, or it's the VCs, or it's money, or it's time, is I try to peel back what they can do. Right. At any level? Yeah. So. I so mean, typically I'm speaking to more leaders, but um, I actually do believe that leadership is at all levels. And so you can impact any time. So what's the, what do you find to be the, the lever or the tipping point or how, how do you, how do you get that mindset switch to flip? To yeah. Like, what is it that you find, or what are the mechanisms you find? Because I think that's a common challenge that people have, whether right. it's growth restraints or other. Like, how do I, how do I flip that leader's mindset towards one of being the solution? First, yeah. I try and think: are are they flippable? Mm -hmm. I I have learned that there are some people who are so entrenched in their beliefs that I wish them well, but I I want to spend time more with the people who already believe and they want to figure out the how. So, so maybe I'm a little bit filtering. Okay. But if they're on the cusp, like if I believe and they're growth mindset oriented and we could get somewhere, then I try to figure out what's blocking them in terms of it's, if it's their own personal belief or if it's someone else's belief that I could help them see in a different way. Um, I actually find a lot of it is psychological. Like I really believe in b the behavioral econ and you know, we can think super logically, but if we don't get below and understand the emotional side, we don't get there. And we've seen this in diversity inclusion where the business case has been made over and over and over again. Right. It only really shifts when you believe the moral argument. Because the moral argument is either yes or no. Right. And if it's not yes, I'm not in with, you know what I mean? Right. So, so sometimes I'm not always trying to flip mindsets. I'm really fixing more on the how right. we get it done versus the should we get it done. Because if they don't really believe, I feel like there's enough believers that that's actually worth our energy is spending time figuring out the how. That's a really interesting point because I think even some of this work, you know, like at a work human conference and we're talking about the things we're talking about, some of this is a moral argument too. Like yeah. it feels like, you know, like the human workplace thing is a choice. It's a moral, you, because you can, you can run a business and succeed at some level without it, without treating people. Oh, we've seen tons of it, right? And so why yeah. has to be kind of connected to moral, even though we, I believe it's better business. Yeah. You've probably seen that. But right. That's a choice. Right. That's interesting. So, so when we talk about this idea of creating a engaging work experience or a more engaging workplace for employees, what is it that you think leaders most fundamentally misunderstand about that work? Hmm. What, what is the, the thing that gets in the way or stops them from being on board with that? Ah, uh, that's a great question. What stops them from believing right. that, that this it's is a, a good mind, idea? It's a mindset largely, right? I mean, yeah. because- It's hard because I believe they, it. They, they, well, right. <laughs> they dismiss, you know, they often dismiss kind of offhand that engagement is X or whatever, right. you know, it's like there's something that they, whether it's engagement or doing the work to create a more human workplace, right. there's something going on that generally gets in the way. I'm just curious from either a belief or... Yeah, so I think it kind of goes back to the logical emotional side, right? So logically, a lot of entrepreneurs are, or maybe leaders, right, are thinking about what's the algorithm or what's the market opportunity and it's logic you know it's business case it's uh that's why you start a business there has to be some sort of rationale behind it 
And so if they're so focused on the logic and they're missing the emotional side, I also think then they're also miss missing the emotional side of the customer experience. Mm -hmm. so, so one gateway drug I've done is to help them think about how the customer experience, if they're because they're usually locked solidly on that, right. how, how might the employee experience be the exact mirror of the customer experience and how do we think about, like they run design thinking sprints to design their product, why not do a design thinking sprint to run how to make work better? Right. And so if we can align that way, sometimes that feels more business focused, even though we're getting to the ethnography and emotional side of the employee experience, you sure. know what I mean? Yeah, so absolutely. part of it is using the business language in the employee experience in a way that then furthers the customer experience. So when you are, when you are working with a client to help them start this process of making work more um, human, human yeah. or engaging, whatever. Where do you start? How do you take a client through that? Um, hmm. I like to think of it back to the like what matters most, right? Okay. So meet them where they are. So if the if the request is we're overworked and we have a, a retention issue, or if it's diversity and inclusion and we have an equality issue, or all voices being heard, or creativity, I try to meet. I try to really get into what is the thing we're solving because there are so many things to solve, uh, sure. and and so one of the things we do in design thinking sprints is really try to make sure that we know what problem we're solving right. um, because there are too many. So, so I guess probably the thing I start with is how do we define the problem that they care about most and then meet them where they are and with whatever it is, then we can run a sprint against it and we can put data against it and, right, um, and, and try an experiment. Got it. When I, I, I would love for you to talk about, because it sounds like part of your work is also helping um, coach people around shifting their relationship with work and life and how they think about that and thinking about constraints and that. Yeah. Can you talk about how you help people sort of reframe that? Yeah. So I love neuroscience and I love behavioral econ. I find that, especially in the Bay Area, it's a very data-driven scientific uh, community. And so, and that's true for across companies, sure. but it's just sort of a cultural norm. Sure. So I try to start with the, the science side, right? Which is like, okay, this is what we know to be true. And then how might we um, unlock some part of their belief system that gives them more of a virtuous cycle. So back to the work-life conversation. Right. Um, if we know that if teams have design constraints over individuals, it's more effective. And I'll give you a real example. So Leslie Perlow is a professor at Harvard Business School. She did a longitudinal study around how when teams have design constraints over maybe not working at night or Wednesdays, you know, work from home or whatever the team design constraint is, but it's about containing the time, okay. but you have to do it at the team level, then the work quality actually goes up and the number of work hours goes down. Wow. And so this belief that more work is better can be systematically like shown to be not true. Right. <laughs> right? Right? But it matters that it's at a team level. Because what's in an individual, what we've seen in the social sciences, is like that you say, like, I would like flexibility. Now you're violating the ideal worker norm that you're all in worker, right. and now right. you're like an outlier, and right. we're not, we don't really trust you, and you're right. not really loyal, or whatever our belief system is. And so if we make it about team design constraints around work life, sure. um, then it actually fuels creativity. And that's what we see in the research over and over again of, you know, we all have design constraints, whether sure. it's time, money, or location, whatnot, and so rather than seeing it as like a, a negative, it's like how is it fuel for creativity, and that's how I like to approach the work-life conversation. That's, no, that's awesome. Yes, uh, let's see, so w one, one of the, I guess, fun questions we've been thinking about or tossing out is, <clears throat> if, I, if I handed you a magic wand, and you could use that magic wand to um, sort of eradicate or will into extinction a management practice or uh, mindset or dogma that you see in today's reality, yeah. what would it be? The hero in work, like the 10x coder, the, mm -hmm. the one person who typically is a guy, you know? Normally it's not the heroine. Right. Um, the myth of the hero versus the team, I mean, work is dumb at a team level. Right. So unless you are a, a solopreneur, then, and then you are the hero of your own story, fantastic. Right. Uh, I would like heroes to be seen as team heroes. <laughs> right. How do we, 
how do I make you better? How do you make me better? How, you know, that. Right. I would love to have uh, work be seen more as a team sport. Um, because even though it sounds right, when we go back to the office, what typically is, is like individual performance rewards and, you know, this person worked all night, you know, trying to fix this problem and it still has this myth of an individual hero and zero sum. I'm yeah. really tired yeah. of the zero sum. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, I think there's a little bit of what gave fuel to that too, is this narrative we had over the last, what, 20 or 30 years too, that says, um, leaders started to buy into this idea that a small percentage of your workforce is producing a vast majority of the work. Kill me now. Like, right? And that, that also <laughs> fed it. And so they're even afraid to confront the hero. Right. Right, right, right. Right. It's like the rainmaker, the untouchable, the, the asshole right. who we can't fire. Because right. we're so dependent right. and the whole place will burn down right. and fall apart. It's, it's just a belief system. And, you know, yeah. typically if you challenge that belief and try something new, something totally new might emerge. In fact, I just was hearing the guy from Microsoft say that uh, they no longer have a high potential program mm -hmm. because what it did was it created in-group and out-group sure. people. Everyone has potential. If you believe in growth mindset, which is also a longitudinal study, right? right everyone has potential. Now, they may be in the wrong job, on, you know, on the wrong sure. team. Sure. It's not that everyone's going to thrive and succeed in that role. Right. But the question is, how do we just see work as a team sport in a way of that everyone's high potential? That's awesome. Any last quick um, words of advice for a leader or an HR manager? So my advice for people, what you could do next week that would help the whole team is to actually ask them. I believe that we don't have to have all the answers. So how might we ask questions of our team to say, how do we do better work together? What are the design constraints that fuel us? And how do we do it as a team? Um, and that, that, I believe, will allow people to have better work and better lives.